Welcome, Impactful Parents. Today, we're going to talk about how the pandemic changed teen substance use and teen mental health. Hello, my name is Christina Campos. I'm founder of The Impactful Parent, and I help parents of school-age children turn their chaos into connection with their adolescent. I offer parent education videos every week, online courses, and coaching. And if that wasn't enough, I bring experts in on other fields onto The Impactful Parent stage to teach you even more. And today I have a special guest. His name is Richard Capriola. And Richard has been a mental health and substance abuse counselor for over two decades. He has treated both teens and adults diagnosed with mental health and substance use disorders, and he is also the author of a book called The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse. I'm very happy to have him on today so that we can learn so much from him. Thank you for being here, Richard. Thank you, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to the program. Absolutely. Uh, For those of you who follow me here on the Impactful Parent, Richard is um, actually a returning guest because his wealth of knowledge is just amazing. And so I'm very happy for him to be here. Um, And this new subject about the pandemic changing how kids are using substances and their mental health, this is so important. Can we start with a brief overview of how the pandemic impacted our teens? Yeah, we can. Uh, And thank you again for inviting me to the program. And for any parents that are listening, uh, Christina and I had a discussion not too long ago about adolescent substance abuse. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen to our conversation, I would encourage you to do so because we shared a lot of information about teen substance abuse, warning signs, treatment options uh, that we hope that that as parents you find helpful and useful. So if you haven't had a chance, take a look at that uh, discussion discussion and hopefully you'll find it helpful. Uh, Today we're talking about how the pandemic impacted teen substance use and also teen mental health. And what we noticed was that during 2021, when we were in the middle of this pandemic crisis, uh, teen substance use actually declined. So during 2021 and the during the pandemic year of 2021, teenage use of of drugs like alcohol and marijuana and nicotine vaping all significantly declined. And interestingly enough, prior to 2021, for about three years before 2021, we had seen a dramatic increase in teenagers who are vaping materials such as nicotine and marijuana. So parents, what vaping is, uh, they'll, they'll take an instrument that turns a substance like nicotine or marijuana into a vapor. Um, they use a vaping pen like a jewel, for example, and then they will inhale it. Well, for about three years prior to 2021 and the pandemic, we saw a dramatic increase in teenagers who had turned to vaping nicotine and marijuana. So during the pandemic, the percentages dropped. For example, the percentages of high school seniors who were drinking alcohol dropped from 55% to 47%. Among 10th graders drinking alcohol, the percentage dropped from 41 to 29%. When we look at marijuana, High school senior, the percentage of high school seniors smoking marijuana dropped from 35 to 31 percent, and even nicotine dropped dramatically. Nicotine vaping and marijuana vaping all dropped substantially during the pandemic, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that during 2021, kids were pulled away from school. They were pulled away from their social, you know, friends. There just wasn't as much opportunity to uh, to engage in these activities. Activities. And one of the things that we know that p- fuels uh, teenage substance abuse is availability, how easy these drugs are available. So during the pandemic, that availability, which is pretty high among teenagers, uh, they tell us it's not a problem finding these drugs. Well, during the pandemic, that, that availability really went down. Um, and, and, and I think that accounted for uh, some of the decline, if not most of the decline we saw during 2021. On the other side of the coin, while we saw a decline, a significant decline in uh, substance abuse among teenagers, we saw a dramatic increase in mental health crisis. So substance abuse went down, mental 
health crisis went up. And that's not anything new. Uh, for 10 years prior to the pandemic, we had been witnessing a, a real crisis in teenage mental health. Well, I'm going to pause you there. And it's so interesting that everything, well, that the substance abuse went down yeah. due to availability, which makes sense. Um, but very sad that that mental health uh, issues went up. So yeah. can you explain a little bit more about what that mental health issues, what those look like in a teenager? Um, yeah. What were parents seeing that wasn't there before? Well, what we saw was kids who were reporting higher levels of feeling depressed, higher levels of, of anxiety. Um, and, and those two, anxiety and, and depression, pretty much doubled among the teenage population during the pandemic. Doubling and is wow that is that's a huge increase yeah it is it is and also in 2021 we saw an increase in emergency room visits for suspected suicide they were 51 percent higher for girls and four percent higher for boys now what were the students telling us well they tell us that they were feeling anxious some of them reported feeling angry Others reported feeling annoyed, and they also reported feeling bored and feeling sad and feeling lonely, and many reported sleep problems. And I think, you know, this is an indication of how the pandemic affected the entire family. We see this in kids, but many of these same symptoms were being experienced by adults, too, who were going through this pandemic crisis and this mental health crisis. So it affected the entire family. But I think because prior to the pandemic, we had seen a, a, an increase uh, in, in the mental health crisis among our teenagers, this pandemic sort of just ignited it even more. Um, but, but for about 10 years before the pandemic, we'd already known that there was a crisis developing among teenagers in mental health. It makes sense to me that the mental health crisis went up when everybody's mental health crisis went up, like you said, not just our teen, yeah. but specifically with the teen culture, because they were thrown out of routine, of uh, their right. daily lives, which as we both know, kids thrive off routine. It creates stability and just so much uh, help with them to be able to cope with day to day routine does so much for kids. And yeah. then in addition to that, um, I actually had high school uh, seniors around the pandemic time too. So there was things that was taken away from them that they were excited about and had looked forward to their entire life, like prom and graduation. Yeah. I mean, the idea that they couldn't walk across the stage to grab their diploma was really devastating to a lot, including um, our athletes who were literally banking on sometimes scholarships or mm -hmm. colleges to look at them and then they couldn't even play. So it actually um, really hurt a lot of athletes who had to, oh, the only way to get to college was to go through the athletic department and, um, and get that help through scholarships and then they weren't able to get them. So I can't imagine how devastating that must have been. It, it was a, it was devastating to a lot of kids. Uh, you know, they were confined at home. You know, they, they, they weren't able to participate in their extracurricular activities. They weren't able to go to school and, 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 and be among their friends and have their academic routine uh, the way that they were accustomed to having it. And that's uh, everything to a teenager. I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's their whole social world. And, 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 and their interaction was pretty much confined to social media applications, you know, um, and that was their way of communicating with the external world and with their friends. And on top of that, they also saw what their families were going through. You know, maybe, maybe, their, maybe their parents' jobs were being disrupted. Maybe some of them lost employment. And, you know, this entire way in which we lived was, was dramatically shifting among them. And, 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 and how do you prepare a teenager for that kind of dramatic change? You, you can't. Um, and they struggled through it. And, and, 
and, and even some of them, I think, uh, have had a struggle getting back into the regular classroom routine now that now that we're in the school year, it's coming to a close. But I think at the beginning, some of them struggled with getting back into the normal classroom routine. Well, hopefully things have settled down now and, and kids are back more into their traditional academic uh, routine at schools. And that brings me to my next question for you is, how is that looking now? Did the mental health stay low or are we seeing some change in our kids for the positive um, also with substance abuse is, is because they're back at school, is that going back up or, you know, did the kids kind of break those bad habits and now they're doing a little bit better? Well, that's a question that we really want to know the answer to. And we'll know the answer uh, after the first of the year when there will be new national data that comes out on adolescent substance abuse. And we'll be able to see what happened during the 2022 year, you know, and actually the, the academic year, 21, 22. We'll be able to see if now the kids got back into their normal routine, they're back into socializing, they're back into school. Did the decline that we saw in their substance use in 2021, did that stabilize? Did it continue to go down or did we witness an increase in teenage substance abuse now the kids are back into school? We'll have that data shortly after the beginning of next year and it'll be very interesting to see you know, what happened to that decline that we saw during 2021, you know, but we'll have that data after the first of the year. In terms of mental health, I think we're just scratching the surface on what, what we're seeing for both adults and for adolescents. Um, I, I, as I had said earlier, we had already seen a crisis in teenage mental health prior to the pandemic. The pandemic just sort of ignited it. And I think we're still seeing a crisis out there where, where a lot of kids are either not being diagnosed or not getting the treatment that they need to help them with their mental health struggles. Well, when you get that data, that is just another reason to come right back onto the Impactful Parent. <laughs> so. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be back so that we can share with parents, uh, you know, what happened the year after the pandemic. Yes, we'll need an update. But until yeah. then, what can families do to help their children go through these mental health issues? You know, that, that, that's a good question. And, and if, if parents will visit my book's website, you know, www.helptheaddictedchild.com, they can learn about, you know, the book, The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse. However, I've also posted two blog articles that they might be interested in reading. And, and one is um, a brief blog on how the pandemic affected uh, teenage substance use. It goes through pretty much what we talked about and a little bit more. There's also an article on how the pandemic affected teenage mental health. And in that article, I have posted 10 questions, 10 questions that you can ask your child to sort of check in on their mental health. These questions come from Newport Academy, which is an adolescent treatment center that I referred many kids to. They do outstanding work. Um, but these 10 questions, parents can use as a check-in with their child every once in a while, just to get a, a check on their child's mental health. For example, one of the questions is, ask your child, what three words best describe how you're feeling right now? What three words would, would, would capture and describe how you're feeling? Another one is, if your feelings were weather, what kind of a day would it be outside? So you can use these, these questions every once in a while to sort of do a, a check-in with your child and, and their mental health. I'm curious, what is your recommendation for having the check-ins? Is it once a month, once a quarter, once a year? I, I would say, depending on what's going on with your child, uh, you might want to do it maybe once a week, once every couple of weeks. If you notice something out of the ordinary going on, then you might want to jump in. Say your child comes home and seems a little bit down or a little bit depressed. Um, you might you might start the discussion by you know saying that you noticed that your child is uh, feeling a little sad today and, and inviting them to talk about it. And you could start that discussion by saying, well, if your feelings were weather outside, you know, what kind of a day would it be? And they might tell you, well, you know, it's going to be a rainy day. It's going to be a cloudy day. 
it's going to be a sunny day. And then you can follow up with that information with your child. But it's sort of a sort of an easy way to get a barometer on what's going on with your child. How often you will do it is basically as a parent, you observing your child and deciding, OK, something maybe I need to check in on my child on this. I love this extra resource that you're giving me because I'm always trying to get parents to go to different things to to check in with their kids' mental health. So this is fantastic. Um, But teenagers can be moody (laughs) and they are going to tell you that it's a horrible rainy day, you know, pretty often sometimes because they are moody like that. But um, do you have like a scale of concern? Like at what point... Am I, as a parent saying, all right, I've gotten these answers uh, too many times that were negative. Now I should start raising a red flag. Or is it just the first time it's raising a red flag already? Well, like you said, kids are, teenagers are moody to begin with. You know, they're, 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 their emotions are going to run all over the place. And as I think as a parent, what you want to pay attention to is how often are you seeing this moodiness? How often are you seeing these signals of of perhaps anxiety or depression? Is this something that comes and goes fairly quickly? Okay, I probably wouldn't be too concerned about that. But if they start to linger for day after day after day, then I think you might want to follow up and, 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 and ask your child a little bit more questions. And and, and, and to approach them from the standpoint of having an inquiring point of view. In other words, you don't want to tell the child that you think they're depressed. You want to tell them what, you, tell them what you're observing and invite them to talk to you about it. For example, um, you know, I noticed that you, that, that, that I feel like you're, you're down for today. I feel like you're having you know, a bad day today. Can you help me understand what's going on? Or, you know, I sort of sense that you're upset about something because you're angry. You know, can, can you help me understand what's going on? So what you're doing is you're inviting the child to engage in a conversation with you. Now, sometimes that will work, sometimes it won't. Um, but the other thing is when you're talking to your child, you know, you, we're good at listening to the words they say, but we're not so good at listening to the feelings. But that's a skill that every parent can learn so that when our child is talking to us, we're not just hearing the words, we're hearing the feelings. But I think it begins by having an inquiring point of view, explaining to your child what you're observing, express to them how you're concerned, and ask them to help you understand why you're sensing what you're sensing. In other words, just don't say, well, I think you're depressed. You know, you you need to invite the child to, you know, give you feedback as to whether what you're sensing is right or wrong. And just as a reminder for parents, let's say you do those things, you start asking, and now I'm really concerned because of the answers that you gave me. What do I do as a parent when I feel lost and scared? (laughs) Uh, The same thing you would do if you feel concerned that your child is using a substance. Uh, What you want to do if you're concerned your child is using a substance, if you're concerned that your child's mental health might be deteriorating, uh, as a parent, your next step is to get a professional assessment uh, for either the substance use or the mental health. So that you need to rely on the professionals to do the assessments, give you a diagnosis if it's appropriate, and a treatment plan or recommendations on what should be next. Now, you can start that process, you know, by contacting the school counselor or contacting the school social worker or the school psychologist. Many times they can do some of these assessments for you. If not, they can recommend professionals in the community that can do them uh, for you. But I would say your first step, if you really start to get concerned about your child's suspected use of a substance or their mental health, uh, you want to turn to the professionals that can do the assessment and give you a recommendation um, as to whether there's a diagnosis. And if so, what's the best treatment option for you? I love that suggestion. You bring a wealth of knowledge, resources, and just help to the Impactful Parent audience. So I appreciate you so much, Richard. Can you say again where people can find your book and your website so they can grab more of you? (laughs) <laughs> the, thank you. The, the easiest way is to go to the book's website, which is 
helptheaddictedchild.com, helptheaddictedchild.com. When you get to the website, you'll be able to read the blog articles that I've posted. You'll be able to read a little bit about the book and, and read a sample. Um, and uh, you'll be able to read endorsements and book reviews. And if you want to order the book, which is available as a Kindle and a paperback, uh, it, there'll be a link that will take you to Amazon and you can uh, purchase the book uh, directly from Amazon. Wonderful. And parents, I hope today's episode brought value to you today. Plus, if you want to become a more impactful parent, don't forget to download the Impactful Parent app. The Impactful Parent app is free and full of episodes just like this one that's going to help you in your parenting journey. Because investing in your family looks like learning the warning signs of certain behaviors so that you can stop bad things before they start, or discovering new parenting techniques to make your parenting more effective. And it's about joining a community of like-minded parents that also want to be the best parent they can to their child. All of this, plus so much more, can be found inside the Impactful Parent app. So download it today. You got nothing to lose because it's a free resource just for you. <laughs> So go to theimpactfulparent.com and discover how you can step up your parenting game and be a more impactful parent. But until next time, you got this, parents. I'm just here to help.